Hello and welcome to Oceana Weekly. I'm Stephanie Greenfield. New Zealand universities are asking their exchange students in Hong Kong to return home amid the ongoing violent protests there. Auckland and Waikato universities say they have 13 students in the territory. Hong Kong University students have barricaded campuses and stockpiled makeshift weapons as protests continue to escalate with two deaths so far. A University of Auckland spokesperson said it has 11 students in Hong Kong and 10 have said they will leave. The arriving students will not be affected fiscally or academically as a result of leaving their exchange programs in the former British colony, the spokesperson said. Most of Auckland's students are expected to be back on New Zealand soil this weekend. The New Zealand government is challenging the food industry to step up in the fight against obesity. It wants the industry to limit advertising and marketing for junk food, improve sugar labelling and cut down on price promotions for nutrient-poor food in shops. It follows the release of a report by the Food Industry Task Force, which made 51 recommendations including the initiation of the Children's National Nutrition Survey. Health Minister David Clark said obesity was a huge burden on the health care services and the government was dedicating to tackling it. It affected about 1 million New Zealanders, contributing to cancer, diabetes, amputation and heart disease. Health Minister David Clark said that the most recent estimate suggests it costs about $624 million a year. South Korea and Japan both regard their bilateral intelligence sharing pact as essential to safeguarding their people. South Korea, under President Moon Jae-in, should retract its nonsensical decision to scrap the agreement. The Moon administration decided in August not to renew the pact, known as the Geos Mia. It was signed three years ago, and the pact has allowed Japan and South Korea to share information on various security problems, including North Korea's missile launches. Unless the Moon administration reverses its decision, the agreement will expire at midnight on November the 23rd. The expiration of the pact will deliver a serious blow, not only to the relationship between Japan and South Korea, but also to vital security ties with the United States. Japan's standardised university entrance exam will test only reading and listening skills for English in the 2020 academic year. The National Centre for University Entrance Examinations said it will eliminate exam and speaking skills in line with the introduction of private sector tests, which check reading, listening, writing and speaking skills. For the 2021 academic year, the National Centre for University Entrance Examinations Centre will present its exam coverage plan around June next year. Raising the price and not the glass is being seen as the only way to curb New Zealand's alcohol problems. Data from the Ministry of Health's annual survey has found the number of 18 to 24-year-olds who consume six or more drinks on occasion is at 21.1%, up from 165 The number of adults who drink is up from 78.7% to 803 A fifth are now classified as hazardous drinkers, slightly up on last year. Of men aged 15 or older, 18.3% consume six or more standard drinks in a single session every week, up from 16.3%. Alcohol Health Watch Executive Director Dr Nikki Jackson says raising the price of alcohol is the most effective option. There are around 12,000 liquor outlets in New Zealand. A University of Otago study earlier this year found the average Kiwi loses about one week's worth of productivity due to alcohol, costing the country $1.65 billion. The busy Mount Eden train station will be closed for about four years to allow for work on Auckland City Rail Link. Construction on the country's largest transport infrastructure programme will ramp up from the start of 2020, with Aucklanders told to expect widespread disruption over the next few years. Mayor Phil Goff said the Mount Eden station will be closed from June next year until 2024 to allow for underground tunnelling and a complete upgrade of the station itself. Those who get off at Mount Eden station will have to either travel to Kingsland or Grafton train stations or take buses into the CBD. 
A dedicated bus service will also be put on to take people to the Newmarket train station. Some Sky City workers are expected to strike after 50 called in sick with symptoms linked to smoke inhalation from the Convention Centre fire, a union says. Meanwhile, an Auckland air quality specialist says those exposed to the plume inhaled more than three years worth of cancer-causing chemicals in a single day. Unite Union senior organiser Joe Carolyn said 50 workers fell sick after the fire erupted on the roof of the unfinished convention centre on October 22nd. He has prepared a dossier of workers who became ill following the blaze with symptoms including coughing, red eyes, vomiting and diarrhoea. Award-winning journalist, author and documentary maker Bayrouz Buchani has had his first taste of freedom in six years, arriving in New Zealand last Thursday. Buchani has been detained by the Australian government on Manus Island in Papua New Guinea since he fled Iran in 2013. While in prison, he wrote the award-winning book, No Friend But The Mountains, on his smartphone. Now he has been granted a visa to New Zealand to speak at the literary festival Word in Christchurch. The journalist fled Iran in 2013 for the safety of Australian shores. Instead, without a trial or any criminal convictions, he was forcibly held by the Australian government in Papua New Guinea. Buchani said that he left Iran because he didn't want to live in prison, but Australia jailed him. Buchani's been able to slip into New Zealand thanks to the book he wrote while in prison. He was granted a one-month limited visa to speak at the Christchurch Literary Event. More smoke from the catastrophic Australian bushfires is expected to hit New Zealand and could have damaging health effects. The fires in rural New South Wales and Queensland are so large that smoke and dust is travelling 4,000 kilometres across the Tasman to cover New Zealand. Fire scientist Grant Pearce says it's causing red skies, amazing sunsets and eerie dreamtime light conditions. But there are also warnings for vulnerable people to protect themselves. An animation from Niwa shows the first of the smoke reaching the South Island early on Wednesday morning before the bulk of it hits the North Island at around 7pm. Samoa's government announced a state of emergency last Friday as the measles epidemic continues to claim young lives in the region. There have been nine suspected deaths from the disease, most of them children, with more than 700 cases reported. All isolation wards are full and the main hospital is at capacity. Many children are in critical condition. The state of emergency will include a ban on any mass gatherings and an urgency will be given to vaccinating 100,000 people. It will mostly impact on government processes in order to fast track and remove red tape prioritising budgets dealing with the measles epidemic. It comes as another child died in Samoa overnight from the illness, pushing up the death toll. Australia's national carrier Qantas successfully completed a 19 and a half hour non-stop flight from London to Sydney. The Boeing 787-9 Dreamliner took off from London's Heathrow Airport last Thursday morning and touched down at Sydney Airport 45 minutes behind schedule at 12.30 p.m. on Friday. The 17,800-mile journey was part of Project Sunrise, Qantas's goal to operate regular non-stop commercial flights from Australia's east coast cities of Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne to London and New York. Last month, Qantas completed the first non-stop flight from New York to Sydney, which took 19 hours and 16 minutes. Another New York to Sydney flight is expected next month to round out the project. Sydney could be facing level 2 water restrictions by Christmas as dam levels continue to fall and the drought crisis shows no sign of ending. Level 1 water restrictions have been in place since June for residents of Greater Sydney, the Blue Mountains and Illawarra with fines of $220 for individuals and $550 for businesses caught breaking the rules. It was the first time water restrictions have been imposed since 2003 during the millennium drought and were equivalent to the level two restrictions during that time. The Daily Telegraph reported Sydney only had enough water to last until May 2022 based on current forecasts. 
The current policy is for Level 2 restrictions to kick in when Sydney's dam levels hit 40% sometime around February, but the government is considering bringing them in sooner. Now we're going to cross over to Voice of America. Samira Sreya doesn't have to look far to know times are changing. She sees it right here on the family farm. There hasn't been rain in recent years. A lot of my fruit trees died. Three quarters of Tunisia is threatened by desertification, land severely depleted by urbanization, population growth, intensive agriculture and climate change. It's a problem across North Africa, which is getting too little rain and sometimes too much. Its coastal areas are threatened by rising sea levels. The entire Mediterranean region is considered a climate change hotspot, more vulnerable to its effects than other places. To the south, encroaching desert. South of the Sahara, a group of Sahel countries have launched an ambitious Great Green Wall initiative to plant hardy trees and grasses to fight desertification. Donc le but c'est de replanter des arbres the goal is to replant trees, to return the Sahel to what it was about 60 years ago, when there was more forest cover. Bwetch believes a similar regional initiative could also take root north of the Sahara. Bien sûr, bien sûr que ça peut marcher. Of course it can work, but the first problem is water. The second is getting communities to accept the projects. So far, North African countries are fighting desertification individually, restoring oases and planting tough native plant varieties. But experts say much more needs to be done. Here in eastern Tunisia, Sred and fellow farmers are growing drought-resistant acacia and moringa trees valued for their health properties. But some of the trees have died and earning a profit isn't easy. Everybody likes new products, but it's hard to market them. These farmers aren't giving up. They know climate change is here and they have to act. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Birsala, Tunisia. Thank you for joining us here at Oceana Weekly. I'll see you next week.